Hi everyone, Mrs V here and today we are going to be learning about organic synthesis. I have a really intriguing story for you about the birth of the pharmaceutical industry and we are going to learn how to synthesize organic molecules. I can't wait, let's get into it. The goal of organic synthesis is to build a particular molecule from readily available starting materials. And this is really important in the pharmaceutical industry. It's going to allow the production of commercial quantity of useful compounds. By the end of this video, you'll understand the process of synthesis and you'll be able to design the synthesis of some simple molecules like esters or amides. Now get comfortable, maybe grab a snack because I am going to tell you a story. We're going to start by talking about the common pharmaceutical product, aspirin. The original synthesis of aspirin actually marked the birth of the entire pharmaceutical industry. It starts with salicylic acid. It's a natural substance that's related to synthetic aspirin, and it occurs naturally in the plants myrtle, willow, and meadowsweet. Now, salicylic acid has been used for thousands of years for medicinal purposes. In fact, there are 4,000-year-old clay tablets from the Assyrians that actually recommend the use of willow leaves for rheumatic disease. Meadowsweet was one of the sacred herbs for the Druid Celts. Hippocrates is known as the father of Western medicine. When you finish your medical degree, you'll swear the Hippocratic Oath, become a practicing physician. Hippocrates, even before Christ, recommended extract of willow bark for fever, pain, and childbirth. Ancient Egyptians described the use of willow leaves or myrtle to treat joint pain. In fact, Edwin Smith, who was an American trader living in Cairo in the 1800s, in 1862, he purchased two ancient scrolls that have actually been dated back to 1500 BC. These are known as the Edwin Smith Papyrus, and they're actually some of the most important documents in medicine. They actually record the use of salix or willow to relieve pain among other herbal remedies. Ancient Chinese, Roman and Native American civilizations have actually all recognized the benefits of plants containing salicylic acid. The first person to actually publish any scientific literature about the use of salicylic acid for treating fevers or agues, which is the kind of fever where you get hot and sweaty and then shivering and chills alternately, like you get if you have malaria. The Reverend Edwin Stone. In 1763, he published an account of the success of the bark of willow in the cure of the agues. He accidentally tasted willow bark and noticed that it tasted like Peruvian bark, which is a source of quinine for treating malaria. Now, I'm not quite sure how you accidentally taste the bark of a tree, but I can tell you it's giving me a fabulous mental image. The good reverend used what was known as the doctrine of signatures. Now, the doctrine of signatures is that nature actually leaves us clues about the healing power of plants. And the good reverend knew that willow trees like wet, boggy soil, so he figured it could cure illnesses that thrive in wet conditions. So he collected some willow bark and he dried it on the outside of a baker's oven for a few months. He pounded and sifted it. Then he experimented on his own fever, which amazingly disappeared when he took the willow bark. He then experimented on his parishioners and he found that it cured most of them of their agues. But if that didn't work, he added a bit of quinine and then it worked. So maybe those patients actually had malaria. So he wrote to the Royal Society which was an organization of prominent scientists in 1763, outlining the benefits of willow bark. Once that information was published, scientists were really keen to isolate the ingredient of the willow bark that was responsible for those healing effects. In 1828, Johann Buchner purified salicin from willow bark. Now he's not the Buchner of the Buchner flask, that was named after Ernst Wilhelm Buchner who designed it in 1885. In 1829, Pierre Leroux actually refined that extraction of pure salicin from willow bark. In 1838, Raphael Piria produced a stronger compound from salicin, and he called that salicylic acid. And this was much more effective in curing pain. 
In 1859, Herman Kolbe synthesized salicylic acid, and this is the first generally accepted synthesis of an organic compound from inorganic materials. Being able to synthesize salicylic acid meant that it was no longer necessary to use natural products to obtain it, and that set up the possibility of making commercial quantities. Unfortunately, though, salicylic acid tasted awful and it really irritated the stomach. So people were cured of their fever, but they ended up with awful stomach pain. Enter Felix Hoffmann and Arthur Eichengrun. They were both working for the German pharmaceutical company Bayer. Eichengrun was Hoffmann's senior in the research team. Now in 1897, Felix Hoffmann synthesized acetyl salicylic acid. Arthur Eichengrun claims, though, that he invented the synthesis and he instructed Hoffman how to make it. He claims Hoffman had no idea what he was actually doing. He was just following instructions. Heinrich Dreser, who was the head of the Pharmacology Institute, he wasn't even keen to pursue aspirin as a product because he was way too focused on Bayer's fantastic new product, heroin, that they were producing from morphine. Yes, heroin was actually produced as a medication in those days. Eichengrun refused to accept Dreyser's rejection and he pressed for the development of aspirin. He tried it on himself. He recruited physicians to secretly test it and they found it was successful in treating several painful conditions. Neither Eichengrun nor Hoffman were actually specifically credited with that synthesis, but in 1934, Albrecht Schmidt was writing a history of the Bayer company and he named Hoffman as the inventor. Now, there are some papers that have been written that claim Eichengrun, because he was a German Jew, the rise of the Nazi party had limited his ability to make a claim as the true inventor at that time. Eichengrun wrote a paper while he was in Theresienstadt concentration camp in 1944, claiming to have instructed Hoffman on how to do the synthesis and he claimed he had been responsible for aspirin's clinical testing and Hoffman actually had no idea what was going on. This case was not re-examined until 1999 and that was by Walter Sneeder of the Department of Pharmaceutical Sciences at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow. He actually came to the conclusion that Eichengrun's account was convincing and correct and he made a recommendation that Eichengrun deserved credit for inventing aspirin. The Bayer Company denied this in a press release and asserted that Hoffman was the inventor. But in the end, neither Hoffman nor Eichengrun received any royalties at all for the invention of aspirin. However, Heinrich Dreser made a personal fortune from the development. Of course, with modern synthesis, the introduction of pharmaceutical patents has allowed usually the company to claim ownership of a synthesis that they develop. The synthesis of aspirin relies on the starting material salicylic acid, which is produced using the Colby synthesis that we spoke about earlier, and acetyl chloride. Acetyl chloride is an acid chloride, and these are often more useful in synthesis than carboxylic acids. The acid chloride reacts with the hydroxyl group that's attached to the benzene ring, this is known as a phenol, and that produces acetyl salicylic acid, which we know as aspirin. And hydrochloric acid is eliminated. So a small molecule being eliminated, this is a condensation reaction. It's basically forming an ester group here on the molecule. Aspirin has a variety of uses in modern medicine. It's of course still used to relieve pain and fever. It's great for pain relief, especially for headaches. They have found long-term low dose of aspirin helps prevent heart attacks, strokes, and blood clot formation. And it's even possibly effective in preventing some types of cancer, particularly colorectal cancer. The goal of organic synthesis is to actually create a particular molecule from readily available starting materials. Natural products are usually the starting point. The useful compound is extracted, it's isolated, and its structure is determined. Now that compound might only be present in small amounts in the natural product, so for commercial use, you've got to be able to produce that compound artificially. And discovering how to synthesize a natural product can actually make you a lot of money. Once you've determined the structure of your useful molecule, you're going to need to work backwards into simpler compounds that you could use to make it. This is called performing a retrosynthetic analysis. So let's have a look at the retrosynthetic analysis of paracetamol. 
So this is paracetamol in Panadol. What we see here is we have an amide group. Now we know that an amide group is formed in a condensation reaction. And this particular one could be formed from, we can see here, this part here would be from ethanoic acid. The amine here would be necessary to be able to react with the ethanoic acid to make paracetamol. So we know that amide formation can actually get us from this molecule to paracetamol. Now let's look at that molecule. We have an amine and we can use a functional group into conversion, which is what FGI stands for, from a nitro compound. Nitro compound here, we can actually achieve going from the nitro compound to the amine in a couple of ways. We could use hydrogen gas with a nickel catalyst, or we could use iron, tin, or zinc and an acid. So we know how we can go that step. The nitro compound can be produced from phenol. A lot of syntheses start with phenol. The nitration of a phenol is fairly easily achieved. It can be done with dilute nitric acid or sodium nitrite. So in this case, we have an existing reaction to do each of the steps that could build up paracetamol from phenol, which is readily available. If you don't have a reaction for each of the steps, then you might need to invent one. And maybe that's how you will make your personal fortune. You've actually only studied a few organic reactions so far, which means that your ability to develop synthetic pathways is pretty limited at this stage. Probably an ester or an amide is about the most complex molecule that you could be asked to synthesize. This particular flowchart summarizes all the organic reactions that we've studied so far. So I want you to pause the video and review what you've learned so far. We're going to look at an example now. How would you produce pentyl ethanoate, which is used as a banana flavor, using only alcohols and common laboratory reagents? Let's have a look at the structure here of pentyl ethanoate. Now we can see that that's an ester. And we know how to make an ester. We make an ester from a carboxylic acid and an alcohol. So let's work out what we would make this ester from. Now let's break the ester link and we can see that that would be made from ethanoic acid and pentanoanol. Now pentanoanol is an alcohol. So we're allowed to use alcohol, so we have one of our starting materials. But ethanoic acid, we need to work out how we could make that from an alcohol. Now, we know carboxylic acids can be produced from primary alcohols. So ethanoic acid can be produced from ethanol. Now we have another alcohol, so we have our alcohols only as starting materials. Now we just need to work backwards through this, listing all of the chemicals that we need to use to work from our starting materials back up to our target molecule. So starting with our ethanol here, to convert that into ethanoic acid, we're going to need a common oxidant like acidified dichromate, and we're just going to have gentle heat. Once we have our ethanoic acid, we can react that with our pentanoanol. And of course, we know that's going to need a strong acid catalyst. Probably if you were doing a synthesis, you would need to use the technique of reflux. Once you've done that, you have your pentol ethanoate. So there you have it. You just designed your first synthesis. Now, if you keep this going, you might just discover something wonderful and of course, make that all important personal fortune. Well, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed learning about organic synthesis. I think it's a really interesting branch of chemistry. If you found this video useful or if you found it interesting, please consider giving the video a like. And as always, subscribe to my channel, watch a few more videos, keep learning this fabulous subject called chemistry. I'm going to see you guys in the next video.